So if you haven't read the first one, that will also be available for 40% off. So it's $16 for a hardcover book. Mm -hmm. If you've got a book group going, I think it'd be wonderful, wonderful reading for you group there. They're marvelous. And once she has become a mystery writer, the awards didn't start. She has won the Agatha Christie Award for her fiction. And she has also won the Mary Higgins Clark Award. This is some way. <laughs> and we are absolutely delighted to have us with us. With us. This is Hank Philippi Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, it's so lovely to see you. How many of you are on Facebook? How many of you go to here? Okay. So here's the, I'm taking the Facebook part. <laughs> wave, wave for the Facebook people. One more time, wait. Because <laughs> if it didn't happen on Facebook, it doesn't happen. Yes. <laughs> um, this it is so great to see you all here this morning. I just love the university women groups, and if you have any groups that you'd like me to come speak to, this is one of my favorite um, organizations in the world. Um, libraries also have always played such a big role in my life ever since I was a little girl. I grew up in really rural Indiana, so rural that you couldn't see. Are you okay? You want to come? Are you all right? You're fine. Nobody ever sits in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. Sometimes I think, sometimes I think I'm just going to move these chairs. <laughs> so all of you in the back, come right up here. Anyway, um, you're hiding back there. Okay, it's fine. You can hide. Um, I grew up in really rural Indiana, so rural that you couldn't see another house from our house. And my sister and I used to ride our ponies to the library to get books, and we'd fill up the backpacks, the saddlebags with books, and then take them back home to read in the hayloft of the barn behind our house. And that, so I grew up with reading. And then as an investigative reporter, um, I did, a, of course I would use the library before the days of the internet, there was no one who knew anything more than the research library and our local libraries. Um, and I learned as a reporter in Boston, um, here's my secret, I learned as a reporter in Boston that if I was working late one night and the Boston libraries were closed, I would call the research library, librarian in California <laughs> and get three more hours of work time. And that was completely great. And you know, I visited the libraries in person as a reporter all the time Starting back in the day when, you know, do they still have microfiche? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah. so horrible. Yeah. 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 Whoever thought of that, <coughs> you know, that's an instrument of torture. And the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the um, newspaper reader things where you can look up things on, on old newspapers, which is completely ridiculous because there's no table of contents or anything, so you have no idea where anything is. And I would always get really distracted doing research because it looked, I would look at the advertisements. Like, Oh, look, a hat for $2. That's so interesting. <laughs> I completely forget what I was doing. Um, so libraries have been such a huge part of my life um, from moment one. And so you can imagine the thrill and delight that I felt when my, when my books came out. Mm -hmm. And I got to go to the library and see my actual books in the same place where all of these revered people had been um, my entire life. When I, it was funny, though. The, um, 
What, what I didn't realize, though, when I saw this book and when I saw this book, and I thought, "Oh, my book in the library! This is beautiful. The, the cover is metallic and embossed. You know, this is in publishing world. This is a very good thing." <laughs> I, I picked it up and looked at it. Then I realized it says, "Hank Philippi Ryan, the other woman," <laughs> which, which I might have thought about. <laughs> So then, did we fix it? No. The second book, Hank Philip Ryan, The Wrong Girl. <laughs> so well, the third book, that, as, as you said, is coming out in the fall called Truth Be Told. And that's better. That's Hank Philip Ryan, Truth Be Told. <laughs> so I, I think we've sort of solved the problem. It's really funny. The um, Looking at these juxtapositions of title and name reminds me of a story that we did. I've been a television reporter for almost 40 years now, um, still on the air at the NBC affiliate in Boston, as you know. Um, remind, seeing that, that funny juxtaposition reminds me of a story we did, gosh, maybe maybe 10 years ago now, but less than that. You may have seen it about headlights, not headlights, not headlights, <laughs> <laughs> headlights, the headlights on your car, and how they get less bright as time goes by. Have you had the experience? You're driving at night, you think, oh, I can't see. I used to be able to see, and now I can't see. Um, and it turned out that, I have good news for you, it turned out that it's not that we're not seeing as well as we used to. It's that the, the light bulbs in the headlights actually get less bright as they get older. And the plastic in front of the headlights gets opaque. And so you really can't see, I mean, because the headlights really aren't working as well as they used to. And you should get that checked. <laughs> anyway, we did a big story about it. I reported the story and wrote the story and we shot the story, did all the interviews. and. I went into the edit room and edited the story together and made a little movie of it, because that's what you do for television, is you make a little movie of the story. And the last element of every story that you do, and you've seen this many times, is that re the reporter tapes what's called the stand-up close, C-L-O-S-E, and you've seen those. It's when the reporter comes into the newsroom and stands in front of a big graphic that tells you what the story is about, like big fire, in case the flames didn't tell you <laughs> <laughs> what the story was about. Um, and they say, like, um, uh, as a result of our story, 27 people went to jail, and uh, three new laws were passed, Hank Philip Ryan, seven new. <coughs> That's the stand-up close. You've seen those. So after we put our headlight story together, I, um, you know, I put on all my little makeup and my little reporter outfit and combed my hair, and I went down to the newsroom to stand in front of the graphic for this headlight story. And I go downstairs, and I, I'm standing in my spot. The, the, the graphic comes up electronically. I turn around to see what the graphic says. And it says, dangerously dim. So I thought, oh my gosh, I can't do this. So I go into the news director's office. And I said, look at that. Look at that. I can't stand in front of a graphic that says dangerously dim. And he burst out laughing just like you did. And then he goes, yeah, we really don't have time to change that. <laughs> so I had to stand in front of dangerously dim. It was hilarious. Uh, um, the, only thing, the only thing that I've ever seen that was weirder than that is, um, we, you probably know her. We had a beautiful blonde anchor woman at Channel 7 who had to stand in front of a graphic that said, botched plastic surgery. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll give you a new way of watching TV. You know? <laughs> just, see how, just see how the graphics ma match the person. Anyway, I have been a television reporter, as I said, for almost 40 years now. I've wired myself with hidden cameras. I've confronted corrupt politicians, chased down criminals, gone undercover and in disguise. We've changed laws. We've changed lives. We've sent people to prison and gotten maybe a million dollars, more than a million dollars, um, in refunds and restitution for consumers, got people's homes out of foreclosure as a result of our story. But I never planned to be a reporter when I was a little girl. Um, when I got out of college, I decided that I wanted to do something that would show that I mattered, to leave a mark somehow in the world, that I had made a difference in some way. So with the naivete of uh, a, you know, a 20-year-old, or 19, however old I was, I decided that I would go into politics <laughs> because politics was a way to change the world. I mean, I thought so then.
Um, so I worked for um, several political campaigns. I became a political campaign staffer and really worked hard. Um, sadly, uh, not any of the candidates I ever worked for actually won. <laughs> and this is one of, one of those times when you feel that the universe is saying to you, find another career, right? <laughs> find another career. Um, so when my final candidate lost, a guy who was running for a governor of Massachusetts, finally lost, um, he was out of a job and I was out of a job. Come on in, I'll start over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was out of a job and I was out of a job. So I went to the biggest radio station in Indianapolis, my hometown, Indianapolis, and applied for an opening, um, I applied for the job opening as a reporter. There was a job opening for a radio reporter. So this news director, I got talked to the news director about the job opening for a radio reporter. Now you have to imagine me, 20 years old, skillless, uh, English major, no, you know, ask my parents, unemployable, you know, nothing I could possibly do. I, anybody need a reader? I could read. <laughs> um, so I applied for this job as a reporter, and the news director says, um, the dreaded experience question, do you have any experience as a reporter? And uh, this, is, this is bad, this is what I don't want to hear. So he says, Did you, have you ever written a story? Have you ever done an interview? Have you ever written an article? And no, no, no. Um, Did you write for the school newspaper? How about the yearbook? No, no, no. no. Um, when you were a little girl, did you hand out a newspaper in your paper? I got nothing. I got nothing. But I really wanted to be a reporter. So I said to him, you know, I don't really have any experience like that. But um, I grew up here in Indianapolis, and I know where all the streets are, because <laughs> you have to go with kind of what you have. Um, and I said, and um, your license is up for renewal right now at the FCC, and you don't have any women working here. And I just smiled. <laughs> and the next day, I had my first job. <laughs> I know, we applaud now, and I think it's great. I think it's great. And looking back on it now, how long ago was that? 40 years ago? 50 years ago? It was almost, it was 45 years ago. Yeesh. Um, I can't believe I actually had the nerve to say that. You know, I'm not sure I would do that now, but I was young, and I thought anything could happen, and that was true, right? That was true. I took a chance, and I found my calling. I took a chance, and I found my calling. But I love to tell the story, especially to journalism classes, too, because it, because we have succeeded a little bit. You know, that won't work now. If I went into a television station and said, you should hire me because I'm a woman, they'd say, yeah, you and everybody else in this building. You know, my boss is a woman, and her boss is a woman, and her boss is a woman. I mean, we have made some progress, and I'm really proud to be part of this sort of gender barrier breaking um, group of women who started in broadcasting essentially at the same time um, Leslie Stahl and Barbara Walters and Jane Pauley and Pauline Frederick and um, Nancy Dickerson and all of us got our first job, Jessica Savage, all of us got our first jobs because they had to hire us, because they had to, because we were women. But we couldn't keep them because we were women. We had to be better and work harder and prove um, that the world could be different. And you know, who'd have thought back in the day when you had to get up to change the channel, you know, there are some people who don't have any idea that that was ever the situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, we all do, unfortunately. I know, we all do, exactly. Um, and back in the day when there were only three networks, you remember that, or four, you had to like use two knobs to get the fuzzy cartoons to come in, remember? Um, that there'd be 900 channels, I know we were talking earlier, there's 900 channels, but still sometimes there's nothing on. <laughs> How can that be? Anyway, there'd be 900 channels, and Diane Sawyer would be anchoring the evening news. You know, that, Kate, that Katie Kern, for a while, was sitting in Walter Cronkite's chair. I mean, remember, we that would never happen. That was never going to happen. So I'm really proud to be part um, of the group of people who really changed broadcasting. And I love to tell that story to journalism classes, so they don't forget you know, those of us who came before them, that they don't forget that there was somebody who, that there were people who paved the way um, for their lives. But really, um, from the moment I read my first Nancy Drew novel, and my first Sherlock Holmes novella and short story, I knew that I wanted to be a mystery author. You read Nancy Drew, right, and Sherlock Holmes. You read Nancy's 
like the clue in the old clock, right, and the clue in the diary. Exactly, hidden staircase, exactly. Uh, I thought clue in the diary was clue in the dairy. <laughs> I remember for like the whole book and I'm thinking, Shouldn't there be? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I figured it out. I figured it out. But I was, you know, I was 12. What do you want? Um, and then I went on to all the wonderful British women authors, Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay, Marjorie Allingham, Dorothy Sayers, all those wonderful golden age authors. And I just really fell in love with the mystery, with the storytelling, with the idea that a really good author, a really good writer could tell you a story that would make you forget real life, that would keep you turning the pages, that would keep you guessing, and that in the end, you would say, oh my goodness, I could have figured this out. I could have figured it out, but I didn't. You know, that the story is fair. I mean, I loved that, and I tried to figure out how I could make my life be about suspense and storytelling <coughs> and mystery. And the way, the, the crazy way that the world turned out um, that's exactly what happened. I became a journalist. And that's about storytelling as well. Isn't it? That's about storytelling as well. Um, you would think that writing crime fiction, where it's all out of your imagination, and being an investigative reporter, where it's only the absolute facts, you'd think those two would be very different. But one of the things that I learned that's so fascinating that I've learned to embrace is that whether I'm making stuff up in crime fiction, or whether I'm telling you absolutely the truth, only what I see, only what I hear, only what actually happens as an investigative reporter, it's still only about telling a good story. That's all that matters. A good story with characters who you care about, um, with a problem that needs to be solved, with a solution that can happen. You want the good guys to win, right? and the bad guys to get what's coming to them. Um, you're tracking down clues, you're following leads, and in the end, you get some justice. You get some justice, and you get to change the world a little bit. Um, and when I think about how, what I said to my mom when I got out of college, I want to change the world a little bit. That's sort of what happened. That's sort of what happened, being an investigative reporter and in my crime fiction, too. Um, so. The other thing that's so fascinating that makes the, I mean, of course, in television, you can't make stuff up. That's, 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 the, what, that's the difference between the two. I mean, you can't. Okay, you know that. You can't make stuff up. Okay, I'm just, just, so, just, so we're clear, just so we're clear on that. Um, um, the other thing that is so interestingly and fascinatingly similar about writing crime fiction and writing you know, straight out journalism for television is that both of them are about secrets. Both of them require secrets. You know, every one of those 30 Emmys on my shelf that Betty was telling you about, you know, those are beautiful gilt statues that represent stories that we did, good investigative stories that we did. But they also, each one, represents a secret, represents a secret that someone didn't want me to tell you. Right? Represents a secret that someone didn't want you to know. Represents a secret that someone was trying to hide from you. And that I got to uncover and research and do my reporting and do my investigation and then show you something that someone else was trying to hide. And that is the essence of my novels, too. That's the essence of every good crime fiction novel is secrets. How many of you read crime fiction? How many of you are thriller? Oh, yeah, great. OK, good. We're all together here. <laughs> Um, I'm, pre I'm just past president of National Sisters in Crime, an organization of women who um, loves crime fiction and writes crime fiction. So if any of you are interested um, in joining that, please, um, please let me know. Anyway, uh, I got connections about this. <laughs> anyway, that is what makes a good crime novel, is secrets. Who has a secret? What is the secret? Who's going to tell the secret? And what difference will it make? What will happen when that secret is told? And every good crime fiction novel has that. And so do The Other Woman and The Wrong Girl. These books, this one, um, The Wrong Girl, just won the Agatha for Best Mystery of the Year. It's about, I mean, about three weeks ago. So you think my feet are touching the ground. They are not. <laughs> I am still floating about that. Um, the Wrong Girl is about secrets, is about secrets too. 
Um, and one of the things that is so fascinating about um, having this dual career as an investigative reporter and as a crime fiction author yeah. is that sometimes I'll get a story tip on a story to investigate for Channel 7 that turns out not to be a good television story, but with a little tweaking and a little <laughs> polishing and a lot of imagination um, and some gumption, it could turn out to be a really marvelous crime fiction novel. And that is exactly what happened with The Wrong Girl. Um, I'll tell you the story of how this happened. And then in the Q&A, somebody promised to ask me how I got the idea for the other one, okay? I'll, but I'll talk about The Wrong Girl for a second. The Wrong Girl, gosh, I get hundreds of emails and phone calls and letters a week from people who want me to do stories. And I've learned over the years to try to winnow out how to tell the ones who, that are really good, how, how to tell the ones that are going to turn out to be a new story. So I got a call from this woman who says, Hank, I have a story for you to do. I want you to investigate what happened to my cousin. My cousin. So I said, okay, sure, tell me. And she says, my cousin was given up for adoption when she was born as an infant daughter. She was given up for adoption 26 years ago. And this woman says, last week she got a call from the adoption agency saying that they had found her birth mother and asking her if she'd like to meet her birth mother. Mm -hmm. So she says she thought about it for a while and then decided, yes, she would. She would like to meet her. So this woman says to me, the woman and her supposed mother went up to New Hampshire to have tea in sort of neutral territory. Went up to New Hampshire. They had a lovely time talking with each other, and they liked each other very much. But the woman on the phone says, it soon became clear that they were not mother and daughter. Mm -hmm. So the woman on the phone says to me, can you believe it, Hank? They sent that woman the wrong girl. Oh, and I just thought, ha <laughs> 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 Got one. <laughs> um, and you know, I, the universe, you know, sometimes the universe just provides, does it not? <laughs> is, that not is that not true? So, um, but of course, my first responsibility was to Channel 7 to see whether it was a good news story for Channel 7. You know, so I tuck the phone under my ear and I'm like, okay, who, what, when, where, why, tell me what happened. Because, you know, if an adoption agency is reuniting birth parents with the wrong children, and this happened more than once, this is a pretty huge story. This is a pretty huge story. And I started thinking about that. You know, what could an adoption agency reunite birth parents with the wrong children? Why would they do that? Well, how would that happen? What could possibly be the motivation for that? Are they doing that on purpose? What if they're doing that on purpose? What if there's more than, what if it's happened more than once? What if it's happened several times? I mean, that would be a scandal. That Can you think, imagine the lives that would ch be changed if somebody was reuniting their parents with the wrong children. Oh my goodness. I have to say that at this point in my thoughts, I was also thinking, what am I going to wear to the Emmys? I mean, I can tell you, right? Because um, that's a pretty good story. So, uh, but, but as she began to tell me the reality of what happened in this story, it became clear that it wasn't a television story. And it also became an incredibly interesting illustration of how sometimes real life is so strange and so coincidental that if you made a book about it, crime fiction readers would never believe it. And let me run this by you. I will tell you not what the wrong girl is about yet, but about what happened in real life to this woman. Because what happened in real life to her is astonishing. What happened was, two, I'm gonna make up the names, okay? These aren't their real names. Two cousins who didn't know each other very well, and let's just say their names were Mary Williams and Marie Williams, gave birth to infant daughters on exactly the same day, and unbeknownst to each other as well, gave those infant daughters up for adoption to the same adoption agency on the same day. Oh, oh, they didn't know. <laughs> no, you would never believe that, right? But this is exactly what happened. 26 years ago, 26 years later, 26 years later, Mary Williams is looking for her birth mother, daughter, daughter. Mary Williams, I know this. Mary Williams <laughs> is looking for her birth daughter. And the daughter of Marie Williams is looking for her birth mother. So the adoption agency decides that's got to be a match. 
That's just got to be a match. How can this woman, Mary Williams, be looking for the da her daughter and the daughter of Marie? Got to be a mistake. It's just got to be a mistake. And you know, that's back in the day where, um, you know, a multi-part carbon paper form was, you know, where the pink one on the bottom was blurry and you could never read it and why have that and nobody ever pressed hard enough. And some, it was just a clerical error. It was just a clerical error that because of the names and because of the timing and because of the relationships that happened, this unbelievable coincidence, an unbelievable coincidence. So that, so to me as a reporter, I knew that that wasn't going to be a pattern. You know, that it was, <coughs> it was incredibly unlikely and absolutely, I would actually say almost impossible that another situation like that would have occurred. So it wasn't that the adoption agency was being malevolent or evil or money grubbing or deceptive. deceptive. They were, somebody was just, somebody just made a mistake and it was a one time only thing. So I knew it was, an investiga it was not an investigation for me. Um, a pretty good feature story actually though, so which I gave to Dateline and I'm not sure if they ever did that. Um, but I said to the woman, I'm gonna give your story to the Dateline producers, but would you mind if I used your phrase about the wrong girl as the essence of my new book. And she's like, no, sure, that's fine. You know, it's interesting. So that's what became The Wrong Girl, because I knew in that story, whatever I decided to make it, in what happened to that, that mother and daughter was the germ of a fabulous novel of suspense, because the tension was there, the conflict was there, the love was there, the desire was there. You know, what would happen if in my fictional world, an adoption agency was, or maybe not, if someone suspected an adoption agency was actively, um, on purpose, reuniting birth parents with the wrong children. So I did research, could that happen? Yes, that could happen. Here's how it could happen. And that's what I decided to write a story about. And that's what became The Wrong Girl, which asked the question, what if you didn't know the truth about your own family? What would you do? Now, the wrong, the wrong girl and the other woman are both fun, fast-paced mysteries um, set in Boston and New England. Uh, the other woman, this book is now in its fifth week on the Boston Globe bestseller list, hooray. So I'm so happy about that. Just as you know, just, did I tell you, I just won the Agatha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Um, <laughs> they're fun, fast, if you like, um, Harlan Coben, Tess Gerritsen, Lisa Scottolini, Linda Fairstein, that kind of smart, not graphically violent, not graphically sexy, but smart <coughs> puzzles um, that will keep you turning the pages. That's what these books are. They're a series of standalones. They're about the same people, um, the same main characters. This is the first one in the series, but you can read them in any order, like Sue Grafton. <laughs> you just like Sue Grafton. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can read L, and then you can read B. So you can read any one of you can read my books in any order. The third one, Truth Be Told, comes out October 7th. And someone in the Q&A asked me about that, too. Okay, I'd love to have them planted questions. <laughs> anyway, um, in The Wrong Girl, the main character is Jane Ryland. Jane Ryland is a newspaper reporter in Boston, an ex-television reporter who's been fired from her job as a television reporter for protecting a source. She refused to reveal her source. Her station lost a huge defamation lawsuit, and as a result, Jane was fired. So Jane um, is trying to redeem herself. She's trying to prove that she's a, still a good reporter. And she begins to suspect as we know, she begins to suspect that a respected adoption agency is reuniting birth parents with the wrong children. So she is on the trail of that. And just as I did, just as I did on the phone, she asks, why would somebody do that? What would be the point? What would be the motivation? And how can she discover that? Again, if someone gave you documents saying, this is your mother, these are your parents, this is the stuff that she left for you, You'd believe them, you'd believe them, you'd have no reason not to believe them. And then what would happen if, you know, 20 years later, someone said, you know what, never mind. Here's who you, here's who you really are. And you think about how that would break your heart and think about how that would upset your family and think about how that would upset you and how that would shake your um, whole sense of yourself. And that is what this book is about. Now, The Wrong Girl also brings back the dashing Boston police detective, Jake Brogan, also a main <laughs> character in all in, the, in these books. 
Jake um, is really a cool guy, but he has something of his own to prove. He um, has been made a Boston police detective, youngest ever, and everybody knows it's because his father, his grandfather, sorry, everybody knows it's because his grandfather was the police commissioner of Boston. So Jake has had his way greased into getting his gold badge, and his colleagues aren't always happy about that. So Jake has to prove that he has the right stuff to be a cop. And Jake is on the trail of the murder of a young foster mother. He's called to the scene of a murder of a young foster mother in her uh, Roslindale apartment. They find her on the floor, dead, two young toddlers in the back room, two, a boy and a girl who are too young to talk. And also Jake finds, in the back room of the apartment, an empty cradle, an empty white cradle. So where is the baby that should have been in that cradle? Is it a baby who's on the way? And if so, where is that baby? Is it a baby who was there and is now gone? And if so, who took the baby and where is it now? So Jake is on the trail of the murder of a foster mother and a potentially missing baby. And Jane is on the trail of an adoption agency that may be reuniting birth parents with the wrong children. And in the end, those two points of view stories come together and each, other, and each character helps the other solve their crime. Now, I know you all of you who raised your hands earlier as crime fiction readers, you're thinking, come on, Hank, that's not even a hard one. Adoption agency, missing baby, you know, easy peasy. And I'm telling you, no, you don't know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> two things. Um, two things. One is, um, when I write my novels, I don't know what's going to happen next. I have no outline and no plan. And the only way I can know what happens in the in the stories, how the stories turn out, is for me to sit down at my computer and just write the next page and write the next page and write the next page. And as a result, I am solving the crime. I am solving the mystery along with Jake and Jane. I only know what they know from what I put into the book. So I got to the point where I had to figure out what happened in The Wrong Girl. And I came out and I said to my husband, I can't solve this crime. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't figure this out. And Jonathan says, you always say that, but you always figure it out. And I said, yeah, I know, but this, there's, there's going to be a time that I can't, right? And this could be the time that I really can't. And he goes, you always say that, too. So, <laughs> so I will tell you that when I finally figured out the solution to the wrong girl, I was by myself in my study, and I thought of it. And I just stood up and I went, oh. <laughs> and then I thought, sit down, you're by yourself. <laughs> um, so people say to me, wow, the end of the wrong girl, you surprised me. Wow, the end of the other woman, you surprised me. I say, yeah, I know. Wasn't that, wasn't that amazing? <laughs> that so talk about a surprise ending. You know, I surprise myself. I surprise myself. Exactly the same as in the other woman. I couldn't believe what happened in the other woman. It's just really, Sue Grafton calls it the magic, and I really think she's right. You know, where do those ideas, where do those ideas come from? Um, do you know the, um, do you know the play, the, the musical Sunday in the Park with George, the season, mm -hmm. season, yeah. Stephen Sondheim musical mm -hmm. Sunday in the Park with George? Good. Um, remember in it, there's a song where he's, where Seurat, George Seurat, the French pontillist painter that which is who is the George, um, is standing in front of a blank canvas on stage. And he's painting, and he makes a hat. And he realizes, he sings, look, I, I made a hat where there never was a hat. He, and he realizes that he has created something real that never existed before, out of his own brain and his own creativity and his own imagination. And it's a song about the joy of that, a joy of creativity, a joy of our power, of, that we're the only, you know, humans are the only people who could do that, who can make something out of nothing, out of our own creativity and our, out of our own imagination. And I love that because that's what I feel like I do every day in my study when I'm writing. I'm just making hats. I'm making hats. And I think, wow, look at this. I made this up. I made up Jane and Jake in this whole world that no one ever knew before. Where did that come from? How does that happen? And then you get to be in that world, too. Because I, I, I'm telling you, I believe this as deeply as I could believe anything, that the books 
are not fulfilled until the reader reads them. It's not just the output from me, but it's the input from you. It's that you get to open the door, and you get to be in that world, and you get to see this thing that I got to create. And it's absolutely magic. It's, it's wonderful. It's incredibly hard work. It's nerve-wracking and difficult, but it is, it is amazing. I mean, I'm the poster child for following your dreams in midlife. I, I am, I'm the living proof that following your dreams can happen at any time. I didn't start writing crime fiction until I was 55, which was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I can do that at a time when people were saying, you know, you don't need to do this, you know, just relax. You were, you've been a reporter for so long. You've had a great life and a great career. You've been successful. You don't need to do this. But that little girl in the hayloft, <laughs> you know, wanted to write mysteries. And when I had a good idea, I was just going to do it. I was just going to do it. So, you know, think about what it is that you want to do. If you want to write your book or that book of poetry or learn how to quilt or learn how to speak Italian or take a vacation or start a business or start, start something new, you should do that. You should do that. I'm the proof that that can work. You know, I, if you take nothing from this morning, except <laughs> my books. <laughs> <laughs> you take nothing from this morning except my books. I want it to be this. Um, please do what you've always wanted to do. You know, I don't want you to get up in the morning and regret that you didn't do it. Just go go out there and go out there and try it. This is my message for you. You know, you're the ones that have your dreams. You're the ones who know what they are. Do you know the? Um, do you know the folk singer Judy Collins? Do you know Judy Collins? Okay, um, I love that you're nodding when I say this because um, I uh, <laughs> I told my my producer, who's very young, <laughs> that my husband and I were going to hear Judy Collins at Sam at Sanders Theater at Harvard. I said, Oh, Mary, Jonathan and I are going to go hear Judy Collins at Sanders Theater, and she says. Oh, <laughs> great. No idea, clearly no idea. So I said, Mary, you know, you know Judy Collins, the folk singer. She sang both sides now and all kinds of wonderful songs. I couldn't have gotten through college without listening to her records. And Mary says, records? <laughs> she didn't really. But that wouldn't be funny. She insisted that she knew what records are, okay? I, we, we will believe her. <laughs> anyway, the point of this, and I know you're wondering, is that Jonathan and I went to hear Judy Collins at Sanders Theater. And she told us that when she was a little girl growing up in Denver, her parents had told her that she was going to be a concert pianist. That they had trained her, she took lessons, she practiced, that that was, you know, they insisted that that was her destiny, to be a concert pianist. And she <coughs> said, though, she knew from the moment she knew anything, that what she wanted to do was be a folk singer. That's, that was what was in her heart. She wanted to be a folk singer. And she told us, at age 19, she said, I packed my bags and I moved to New York to be a folk singer. I left Denver behind, I left my parents behind, I <coughs> packed my bags and I moved to New York to be a folk singer. And she said, and I took all my songs with me. And then she said, of course, I hadn't written any of them yet. <laughs> I hadn't written any of them yet. And it just touched me so much, you know, because I think we all have songs. We all have songs. We just may not have written them yet. And I'm here to say, go do that. Go write your songs. I can't wait to hear them. When I finished writing my first book, I called Jonathan in the room, into the room, into my study, and said, sweetheart, watch this. And I typed. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just burst into tears. I burst into tears because I knew no matter what happened after that, I had followed my dreams. I had done this. I had written the mystery, what I'd always wanted to do. Um, but of course, I shouldn't have cried when I typed <laughs> the end because it wasn't the end at all. It was the beginning of this wonderful new second half of my life. And I'm so thrilled. Thank you that you invited me here this morning to share that with you. Thank you so much. Who has a question? Yes. My book is called Bad as Gold. And my friend says, it reads like badass gold. And I said, great. 
<laughs> go with it. <laughs> I'm not changing it. Whatever they read is fine with me yeah, as long as they exactly. read it. <laughs> a, title is a title is a very important thing. Um, the, the other woman was, you know, sometimes titles, I mean, bad as gold is good and bad as gold also good. Um, <laughs> and I get it. Uh, it's interesting, the other woman sprang, you know, some titles are very easy to come up with. The Other Woman is a, is a title that was just, the, that book was always The Other Woman from moment one. Um, I got the idea for The Other Woman, I'll tell you this very quickly, I got the idea for The Other Woman when I was having a root canal. <laughs> <laughs> Which shows you that something good can happen and something bad. I was in the, in the endodontist's office, really puffy faced, you know, cranky, I was angry, the dentist was late, I was missing work, I was gonna have to have a root canal my mouth hurt, you know, what good could possibly happen from this? So I was reading an old people magazine. Not an old people, you know what I mean. <laughs> Not an old people magazine, an old issue of people magazine. And in it was an article about Mark Sanford, the ex-governor of South Carolina, you remember him, who told his wife and family and constituents that he was hiking the Appalachian Trail. There's a euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they call it. Yeah, that's what they call it now. Um, when he was actually off with his sisters. And I began to wonder about the other woman. Who would be the other woman? Who would do that? Why would you do that? You know, it, here you are, you're gonna ruin your life, clearly, everybody gets caught. You know, whether it's General Petraeus on the front of the New York Times or whether it's just you and your spouse in the kitchen, you know, somebody's gonna know. You're gonna ruin your life, you're gonna ruin this, the life of this man you ostensibly love. You know, there's a choice for you. Um, you know, I mean, you gotta remember, I'm in pain in the dentist's office <laughs> thinking about this. Um, and I thought, why would somebody do that? Is it love? Is it passion? Is it corruption? Is it selfishness? Is it power? Is it manipulativeness? You know, what is it? Is it revenge? What is it that would cause somebody to be the other woman? And then I started wondering whether there was a reason that someone would be the other woman that, would, that no one had ever thought of before, a reason that somebody would do that um, that could be acceptable? Was there that? Was there a big... <coughs> juicy, exciting thriller to be written um, about that. And as I was reading the article, someone was quoted as saying, you can choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences. And I just thought, oh, okay, this is my book. I thought, my book, my book, my book, I have this. Um, and that became The Other Woman. And the title of The Other Woman was always The Other Woman. There was no question that that's what it was. The, the wrong girl, you heard the moment when the title came. You know, what, others, what other title could that book have? So my next book, which comes out, oh, thank you for asking. My next book, <laughs> do you see how I do that? My next book, which comes out October the 7th, is called Truth Be Told. Truth Be Told. Now I'm telling you, there has never been on the planet a book that had a more difficult time coming up with the title than Truth Be Told. The book is about a banker turned Robin Hood who decides she is going to manipulate people's mortgage records to keep them out of foreclosure. Um, she decides the bank has a lot of money, and these people don't, and she's trying to help them keep their homes. This is a very lovely thing for someone to do, try to keep someone in their home. It has the problem of being illegal, <laughs> and, um, and is essentially robbing the bank from the inside. So this, the book is about um, the conflict between someone who's trying to do something that's good, the, the result is good, but um, it, it's, she could go to jail for it. Um, it's also about a man who confesses to a cold case murder, 20 year old murder, um, why would he do that? And also about a reporter who makes stuff up. So my first, I, since it's about houses, I wanted to call it no good deed. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Perfect, perfect, right? So, um, because she's doing something good, but it's no good, and it's about deeds, and my, my agent says, that is a wonderful title, it is also a Laura Lippman book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so much for that, no. So then I think, oh, I got it. One false move, one false move, because people are moving into these houses, and somebody has lied, and all good. My, my agent says, wonderful, great title, it's a Harlan Coben book. <laughs> so there 
we were, you know, so there we were. Um, and then I realized that Jane, the main character, says truth, she says truth be told all the time. She says truth be told, that's Y and Z. That's one of her, that's one of her personalities, that's one of her tics, that's one of her things that she says all the time, truth be told. So I thought, okay, you know, that's good. Um, what happens when the truth is told? Just as we were talking about earlier about secrets, what happens when the truth is told? And it's a reporter's responsibility to tell the truth. It's a police officer's responsibility to find the truth. And so that seemed to sort of work. But it was torture coming up with the next book. The next book that comes out next year, the next year, and I hope you'll invite me back for that, is called What You See. And that came very easily too, um, about a murder that takes place at Quincy Market in the middle of the day. And tourists are taking pictures of it with their cell phones. Oh, no. Because <laughs> you know, these days, we can't do anything without having somebody take a picture of it, whether we know it or not. So what you see, and what do you, I mean, what's the other, um, that, the, the rest of that statement, what you see is, yeah, exactly, and what if it isn't? And that's what what you see is about. So Truth Be Told comes out October 7th, Truth Be Told, no pressure, <laughs> it's just my career. <laughs> my writing workflow? Yes. Um, it's really interesting because um, working, trying to juggle two jobs, two full, a full-time job as a reporter, full-time job as a writer, full-time job doing this kind of thing, which I love. And if anyone needs a speaker for an organization, please contact me. I love to do it. Um, so I have to be incredibly organized. The key is to be incredibly organized and incredibly focused, and I do not multitask. So I choose what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on my Channel 7 stuff. I'm going to work on my book. I'm going to work on promotion. I'm going to make dinner. So I just am very organized about my time. I know, for instance, that if my book is due November the 1st, if I have to have 100,000 fabulous words by, by November the 1st, and it is now November the 1st of the previous year, I, 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 will, I make a chart. I make a chart, which I, do. I figure out how many words I have to write, how many days I have to write them. I make a grid. I know that I have to write 640 words a day in order to be done in time. And I just do that. And sometimes I'm behind, but at least I know how far behind I am. You know, so there's no, this, no free-floating anxiety of, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, am I going to make it? I think, ooh, you know, I'm 1,000 words behind, or ooh, I'm 600 words ahead, yay. Um, so it's all about being very organized. And as I said, I, I don't know what's going to happen next in the story. And that's really fun for me. So when I sit down at the computer, it's like, here I, here I go. I'm going to tell myself a story. I'm going to try to make this as fascinating and interesting and surprising and compelling as I possibly can. So I work at the computer. If I tried to write in longhand, I would never be able to read it. <laughs> I type so fast that sometimes do you use word processing? Do you use mm -hmm. word? You know, I, um, I type so fast that sometimes I'll get a little message on the manuscript that says, there are so many spelling errors and grammatical <laughs> mistakes in your manuscript that word can no longer correct them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, 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 and I love to see that because that means I'm typing fast. You know, on, good, on a good day, the story is just coming and you don't even, you're not even, you think, oh, really? Oh, interesting. All right, all right. I just typed a line in the book. I just typed a line in what you see, where one of the main characters says, we can't find Polly. And I thought, wonder who Polly is, you know? <laughs> yeah. not, no idea. You know, where does that come from? <laughs> so um, as the story starts, you know, so I'm, I try to do a thousand words a day. That means I'm really going to be on time. And sometimes that happens, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, some days it's fun. Some days it's torture. Some days it's just, you're just sitting at your desk going, the, no, so, no. You know, you just don't know. And then some days it's just like, I got this, I know what's going to happen, and there it is. So it's fun, it's fabulous, it's completely great. Even on the days it's terrible, it's completely great. Is that what you meant? That's what that works for me. What, you, what did you really mean? Anything. Um, you know, do you get up at 4 a.m.? Oh, like, right. I mean, I've heard different people talk about. You know, if I, I've heard so many writers, like Robin Cook was saying that he gets up at 4 a.m. and writes before anything. 
I got up at 4 a.m. and went to my desk. You know, they'd find me like this. <laughs> clumped, head clumped on the monitor. Not on the chair. I, my metabolism, and I was thinking about this at one point, but I think it might be because of um, working for the 11 o'clock news for so many years and the 6 o'clock news for so many years. I get really pretty good at about 4 in the afternoon um, and really good at about 9. You know, I think that's because of getting ready for the 11 o'clock news. Now, that's not a really good schedule thing because you, that's sort of a life-wrecking thing. Mm -hmm. So I just try to, I just try to write whenever I can. I, you know, the temptations of the internet are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter and email and all the administrative stuff that you have to do. So basically, I try to get all the administrative stuff out of the way as early as I can. That's a little bit mindless. Then, then on the days I go to Channel 7, I go to Channel 7, my husband and I drive to work together serendipitously. He's, he's a criminal defense attorney. Some, uh, serendipitously, our offices are um, two blocks from each other. So we drive to work together, and I read the paper out loud to Jonathan in the car on the way to work. Mm -hmm. And I try to see if I can make stuff up and put it in the story <laughs> to see if he'll notice. <laughs> and he usually does, but sometimes I get away. Um, then we work all day, come home, write from maybe 6.30 till 9, 9.30, then I make dinner. So dinner, cooking was one of the first things to go, <laughs> as Jonathan will tell you. <laughs> There's an awful lot of carry-out salmon involved in <laughs> being, a, and being a novelist. Um, and we haven't had a vacation for many years, and um, somebody told me there's this place that you could go that has like television only really big and everybody sits in seats and you get popcorn and stuff. I, I don't remember those. But <laughs> I know they exist, but it's fun. It's, it's great. Did have any of you read Defending Jacob, the book? Yes. 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 Do you remember Jonathan, the, the defense attorney in Defending Jacob? Mm -hmm. The silver bearded man? Uh -huh. who's the it's Jonathan. That's, that's really? the character is my husband, Jonathan. Um, Bill Landay wrote that book uh, based on a case that Jonathan had and decided just to put Jonathan yes. in the book. Uh, so when you, if you haven't read it, it's great. Bill it's Landay's like really yeah. Isn't it a movie? Can I ask you something? Sure. The way that you write, are you letting your readers know as you go along what might be happening? Are you dropping clues? No, but she's asking if I'm dropping clues along the way. <laughs> Everything is a clue because everything in real life is a clue, mm -hmm. right? I don't, since I don't know what's going to happen and I don't know what's going to matter, I just tell the story that I see. I just tell the story that I see. And I don't know which of those things in that story is going to be a clue. Um, I was reading out loud, I, went, I was in New York last week um, reading at the Center for Fiction and giving a lecture at the Center for Fiction. And they asked me to read a couple of pages of the wrong girl. And I picked this page where Jake comes into the room and sees the um, murder victim for the first time. And there's a lot of his sort of cataloging of what he sees because he's a cop. This is how he thinks. Um, and there are a lot of things in that chapter which I put in not knowing which of them would matter later. And then later, as the, as the crime evolves, I realize, oh, that's why he saw that. Oh, that's why that was there. Oh, that's why that room was like that. So I am not dropping clues in any way because I don't know what the clues are. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So when you say, well, I didn't see that coming, I say, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't either, exactly. And you know, you've read books, you've read crime fiction novels where you think on page four, oh my goodness, she's pregnant and it's in the brother. You know, because it's so clear. Right, it's so clear, and I think my theory is that's because the author knows what's going to happen, mm -hmm. and it is impossible to keep that mm -hmm. foreknowledge out of out of the writing. It's it's impossible to keep that away. So my theory is the only way to surprise the reader is to surprise yourself, and that way I cannot foreshadow because I don't, I don't have any idea what's being foreshadowed. So if you think, oh, here's why she did this, no, I didn't. Because I didn't know. <laughs> yes. Then do you find in editing that you ever have to go back and change Do I find in editing that I have to go back? People um, two things about that. Yes, of course in editing you have to go back because you, as, as a, like a character <coughs> will evolve and a character will start out to be one thing 
and then evolve into being another kind of character. And when I'm doing my editing at the end, one of the passes that I, of the drafts that I do is I go back for character continuity mm -hmm. to make sure that the character's motivation and style and language um, are, are continuous through the book. So, um, so, so, so often characters start out to be good or bad, and then they turn out to be not good or bad. They turn out to be the opposite of what I thought they were when it started. Because people change, right? You say, you say about someone, I didn't realize she was like that. Right? How often does that happen? So I have to go back and make it be more likely that they would be like that. The thing that's even more magical and cool is when I, when I realize what happened, and I go back and see all the clues that were there that I didn't realize were there. I mean, that's the thing. And I think, oh, that's why that coffee was there. I didn't know why she had coffee. That's why she had coffee. I didn't know it. That there's a subconscious thing that happens when you're writing that, I mean, I don't even know if it's subconscious. I don't even know what it is. I don't even know what the word for it is. But there's a storyline that gets laid down uh, that you're just, that the author is just putting there without really knowing why. And then, you know, I'll tell you what this is. Here's what it is. Um, I was on the plane with a guy. Um, you know how when you're flying somewhere and it's like, I'm by myself, don't talk to me. Don't, mm -hmm. don't talk to me, don't talk to me, and you don't look at anybody. Because mm -hmm. I look at the flying time, I'm on book tour a lot, I look at the flying time as a, a lovely time to be by myself which happens rarely. So this guy sat down to me, next to me, and he's like, he's going to talk. <laughs> this guy is going to talk. So I thought, you know what, Hank? Be friendly. You're friendly. You know, fine. Be friendly. You can talk to the guy for however. So he says, what do you do? I say, what I do. I say, what do you do? And he says, he's a consultant. I say, what kind of consultant? He says, emergent design solutions. Emergent design <laughs> solutions. <laughs> so I say, what <laughs> is emergent design solutions? And he says, he said, when you write your book, do you know what's going to happen in the end? And I said, no. And he said, do you have faith that you'll be able to get to that end, even though you don't know what it is? I said, sure, you know, sure. And he goes, that is emergent design solutions. That is a way of thinking, um, a, a way of working on a project where you know there has to be an end, but you don't know what it is, but you're confident you can get there, even if you don't know what it is. And he said there are some people who cannot think that way, some people who cannot believe that there is an end that they can reach, even though they don't know what it is. Writers, he said, you can do it. And that's what I try to teach. That's what he said, that's what I try to teach in my seminars, is the, is the way of believing that you can reach a goal even if you don't know exactly what it is. And I thought that was so fabulous. You know, I th and I think, yeah, and, you know, I, yes, I have faith I can do this most days. Um, I have faith I can do this, um, and that's all I need. So I thank you so much for being here today. This is absolutely great. I'll be glad to hang around for, I'd love, let me say what I, my agent always says I have to say. <laughs> A signed book makes a great gift. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for birthdays, Father's Day, any other graduation, anything coming up, remember last Christmas when you wished that you had a signed book to give someone that <laughs> you wound up giving them, giving them like a candle from the closet? <laughs> I'll be happy to sign a book for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and keep in touch.